How very wonderful is God's call for me to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding or to know what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Every Christian ought to make that an object of their search. Oh, that I might know his will. Oh, that I might be filled with the knowledge of your will. I remember how I was impressed by all these verses when the Lord first saved me. I went through the Bible and picked them all out that talked about walking unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God and verses that talked about pleasing God, being made perfect in every good work to do His will. Beloved, how very, very important it is. And if it isn't important to me, I'm not likely going to do like Solomon did when God came to him in a dream and asked him, what do you wish? You're king now. And I am God. And what do you want me to do for you? Oh, if God came like that to you, what would you ask for? But Solomon asked for a wise and an understanding heart that he might know how to do the will of God. And oh, it pleased God. Ought not every Christian to be minded like that? Should not everyone, after he recognizes that Jesus Christ has purchased him with his own precious blood, should not every Christian say, What wilt thou have me to do? Paul did. The first question he asked when he looked into those wonderful eyes and into, into that face that shone like the noonday sun, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And have you noticed how he opens every epistle of his after that? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. What are you by the will of God? If God has his way, if the will of God is done in your life, something will happen. One thing that will surely happen is that you'll do his will and you'll bring forth much fruit. And you will not be living for yourself anymore. You will be living for him who died for you and rose again. The plan of your life will not be made by your own carnal mind, but it will be made by heaven. Almighty God will make his plan. In fact, he made his plan before the foundation of the world and the harmonies of heaven will begin to play a wonderful music in your life. Every step will be on pitch. You've got a long-range plan over your life. Glory to God. You're geared to heaven. What does he mean here when he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In another place he says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. He talks about the carnal mind that's enmity against God, because the carnal mind is selfish makes me live only for myself. Everything in life revolves around my own well-being and the fulfillment of my own desires. But now Jesus is the center of my life. Jesus Christ commands. He's got a plan, praise God. He says, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee the crown of life. I don't live for this life anymore nor for the comforts of life anymore. Mine eye has seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims upon the earth, they didn't have to seek after earthly riches. They were minded differently. They saw a city coming down from God out of heaven that had foundation, whose builder and maker is God. And that's why God called them his friends. That's why he translated Enoch. Because Enoch had his heart set on things above, not on things on the earth. Oh, beloved, here is a call to prayer to every one of us. We're not going to have a transformed mind. We're not going to be renewed in our mind, and isn't that what's the matter with most of us? And we don't prove. I like that word. Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God will give you a sensitiveness within your soul. A very delicate, delicate.
discernment in your heart and you will quickly know that's not the Lord. That's not God. That's God. Why is it that so many people are deceived? Just recently I came in contact with somebody that was in great trouble. Not far from here. And when I inquired into the trouble, what was the matter? Why this person was belabored by false prophets. Listen, there are people that come to this meeting. They'll sneak around to your back door and they'll come around and tell you what the Lord told them to tell you. Take a broom and kick them out. They're vile. You have a right to know God's will. God Almighty will sanctify your heart and give you the very mind of Jesus Christ. And I know God has prophets, great prophets. I know he has servants today who know his will. And how can you tell who they are? They won't come and tell you what to do, but they'll lead you to the fountain. They'll show you how to find out yourself. They'll show you how to get to the Bible and how to get to prayer. And they'll show you how to discern and find out the will of God because they've gone that way themselves and they've found out that only by the transformation of your mind, by receiving the mind of Christ, by being delivered from the mind of the beast and the carnal mind, can a person discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Oh, beloved, how we lack this discernment, how we lack the mind of Christ, things would be so different in the world and in the church of Jesus Christ. We would, everyone, recognize our place. And our place would be to be the servant of all, to be subject to Jesus Christ, subject one to another, and every one of us would consider the other better than ourselves. We're not going to fulfill the will of God until we do. Oh, to discern what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is to know that I'm a member of the body of Christ and that I cannot live for myself anymore. If I do, I will die. If I do, I'll be cut off from the body of Christ. I will be cast aside as a branch and wither. My business is to do God's will, no matter what others do. I was so happy last night at the altar service to find young ministers lay hold. Well, but they should. As I said last night, if you want to see people saved, you've got to desire it in your heart and help them. If you want to see people baptized with the Holy Ghost, you've got to desire to see them baptized with the Holy Ghost enough to help them. I like to pray with people as long as they pray. One time we had an evangelist here and at the altar. He took me by the sleeve and says, come on, let's go home. These people are going to wear you out. Well, I must admit that sometimes now I am worn. I have suffered in Germany when we've had a large meeting, maybe a thousand people to preach to, and then a few hundred to pray for. And here the people want to get the baptism in the Holy Ghost, and my strength gives out. I can't anymore. And then there are others that had nothing in the world to do all day but to sit there like bumps on a log, and they don't do anything but look around like frogs on ice. It's your business to get busy. Put on the whole armor of God and get to prayer. You're a member of the body of Christ as well as I am. Let's find out. Let's get next to ourselves. Let's get wise to ourselves. Let us get happy over this great call of the King to show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. I was not in the ministry when the Lord saved me, but instantly I knew that it was my great privilege now to live for God. I was in the jewelry business. I was a good jeweler. I was considered one of the best in Chicago. And that was all right, but that was a sign in issue with me now. My business was a pri to be a priest in that shop, to be a witness, to fill my pockets with tracts. I made a covenant with God one time to speak to every soul I got a chance <laughs> to talk to. Sometimes I was bawled out on the streetcar. People didn't like it or the streetcar conductor didn't like it. 
when I get up and pass out tracts or in the barber shop or any place. But that was clear to me. It was my privilege, no matter what anybody else did, to serve the Lord. I remember one time we had a convention and a lot of ministers came to my father's home. And a moving picture was shown that day by the Russellites. His Christian moving picture and the whole gang went down. That I had no time to go. I had to go out with tracks. Why did I have to do that? Why didn't they have to do that? Well, they were reverences, you know. That was the difference. They're fakes. They're preachers. Oh, if you ask them to preach a sermon, had to be the big hunt worst. They'd be there. They'd be on the job. But when Jesus Christ asked you to mop up the floor or to do some dirty job, goodness, he's got another guest coming. Beloved, we're minded like the world. That's what's the matter. And we're going to be condemned with the world. Oh, if God Almighty can come to me and can speak to me. So as he was not able to speak to his Israelites of old. If he can speak to me as a son of God. He'll tell me something else. He'll say, be transformed. Oh, to prove in my soul. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? God. What? It'll make you an inventor. You'll be an inventor. You'll know what to do. And there in the Baptist church, I wasn't saved very long when I suggested having open air services. Oh goodness, the Baptist church. Wow. Go on the street corner. That was the beginning of my call into the ministry. God saw that. And our young people came and they waked up and they lived. And we had a revival. And instead of having socials where boy meets girl, I took them into the forest to pray because we were not allowed to pray in the Baptist church. And the, the young people melted and they found God until the deacons got hold of it and the church committee and they forbade it and they kicked me out. But beloved, from the moment that Jesus Christ came into my heart, I knew what to do. I discerned within my soul, but I had to pray that thing through. What will God do with you if you prove? If your knowledge grows, Paul says, and this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The reason we don't love one another is because we don't have the knowledge of the Holy God. Else I would find out that my brother's my brother. I owe him my life. If Jesus gave his life for me, I ought to give my life for the brethren. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. I wouldn't be likely to go to sleep on the job. But there'd be something forthcoming. And even if I make a lot of mistakes, God would see that. And God Almighty would equip me. And he would soon sanctify me for the master's use and prepare me unto every good work. That's the call of God. A vessel unto honor, sanctified and paid for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Oh, for a Bible school. Oh, for a theological seminary that it teaches men to come down, to humble themselves, to be crucified with Christ, to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. Beloved, often we're headed the other way. God would teach us that the first qualification for the ministry is true manhood, true holiness. A man that hasn't got the moral fiber to forsake the things of earth and to deny himself isn't fit for the ministry. I was in a place in the Middle West where we were having quite a job putting up a tent, taking down a tent. There was a young minister there and one time we needed his help. And when I said, where is George? Oh, he's where the girls are. He was driving the car. This young fellow was supposed to take me home after the work and I had left my coat at home because I was told that I could ride in the car when I wanted to get home, here he had loaded his car with girls, about seven of them. They almost choked him. I don't blame the girls for running after a minister. I was in Lincoln Park one day, 
And here I saw a duck going all along Lincoln Park and all the ganders after her. It was a show. I wish I'd had a moving picture camera. And how these ganders fought among themselves. But if the gander's a student for the ministry, a young minister, you'll see all the geese cackling after him. They will. And if he hasn't got enough manliness to say, No! Be a man! Flee youthful lusts! He ought not to think of going into the ministry. Let him get a job and settle down like everybody else. Beloved, it takes a renewed mind. Holy, it takes a body that's a living sacrifice to be filled with the Holy Ghost, to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use. I think it's a disgrace and a shame on the Protestant church that we've fallen lower than the Roman Catholic church. They at least consider marriage a sacrament and divorce a sin. A moral sin. And do you know why the priests and the nuns are commanded to live celibate lives? That's been assailed a great deal. But there are many honest to goodness consecrated souls. That's why the Catholic Church has such a power in the world. Because they have a ministry that tends to first things first. I think ministers ought to be married. I think they ought to have companions. A man's no good. Spurgeon says without a wife. You found that out. <laughs> Mrs. Bender tells me a bachelor gets funny. Well, some of these poor husbands, heaven have mercy on them. I've seen them. But beloved, to be a living sacrifice, to be filled with the Holy Ghost, ought to be my first concern. My only concern, God will take care of everything else. I know a minister needs help. And if a man finds a wife, the Bible says he finds a good thing and shall obtain favor of the Lord. How blessed is it when husband and wife move together in the will of God and in the love of God and in the Holy Ghost. Two are better than one. One shall chase a thousand and two shall put ten thousand to flight. That scripture is often misquoted because that's spoken about our enemies, not about the saints. <laughs> but anyway, it's the truth. And ministers need helpers, they need assistance. And if God has his way, he will raise up assistance in the church. But another thing a minister will not do, he will not have his pets. That often is the ruination of a minister. He needs assistance, and of course God will give him men and women that he can depend upon. That's wonderful. Jesus Christ had them. He had a John whom he loved, and John loved him. And to him he was able to communicate his choices, revelations. But one thing the Lord showed me very in the very beginning, that I can't have pets. One is so tempted, you know, the natural man likes somebody that flatters him. And so wherever there's a Sherlock Holmes, there's Dr. Watson. Where there's a Barney Google, there's a spark plug. And Mutt and Jeff always are seen together, aren't they? Oh, it's a disgrace. God wants me to minister to the attractive as well as the unattractive and do it with a heart that is pure toward God. We're members one of another. And our ministry must be in the Holy Ghost. But the gist here is that everyone has a ministry, has a gift. And I talked about last night when the young ministers laid hold and they prayed. Do you know that that's the place where God meets you? That's where you get your equipment. When we started out here and God gave us assistance, I used to sit down with them and teach them. If you want to know how to pray for the sick, and get some gift of faith from God. Exercise what you have. Pick out somebody. Pray with them. Pray them through to salvation. Pray them through to the baptism. Pray with them. Stay with them. Stick with them. And as you do, they get the baptism. But you get something from heaven. There are people in the church today that have gifts to bring people through. They do. I remember ministering with one, Brother Tunmore, Joseph Tunmore. 
I was holding meetings in Buffalo, New York, and there were a group of people that came to the altar every night. But you know, when that man came along, everyone he laid his hands on came through just as sweetly to speaking in tongues. He didn't make a fuss. He just had that faith. And I could see the man had that real Holy Ghost desire that people should come through. It was his light somehow that God wanted people to have the baptism as soon as they're saved. We lose that light. Now I'm not complaining at all. I'm very happy over the way God has led us. We don't make a fad of that. And we don't make a hobby of it. And practically everybody walks into the baptism at some time or other and often we don't know when they begin speaking in tongues. And that's very beautiful. But there could be more givenness at the altar and in our prayer meetings. There could be. I tell you, it's a, it's a crime capital crime to come to a prayer meeting and not come to meet Jesus and not come for Jesus Christ. Why we're coming to meet God. We're coming to receive out of heaven. We're coming to draw, to ring the bells of heaven, to be heard on high. That's why we're so flabby. That's why we're so weak and so fruitless in prayer in our daily lives, in our ministry. God is not going to honor those that don't honor him. When I come to a meeting that may be a little bit out of God's will, maybe God will hold me guilty and, and want me to pray that through. Oh, for that love of Jesus Christ that makes me want to see the kingdom of God come and the will of God be done on earth as it is done in heaven. When God gives me that mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, he won't have to pat me on the back before I... I'll go to the mission field or I'll go somewhere and, and do some ministry for him. My, some people have to be served on a silver platter before they'll only get up and give a testimony. Sure. They'll go through a month and two months and never feel a stir of the Spirit within them. Oh, yes, if you, if you do something for them, they will. But oh, when you have that mind which was in Christ Jesus, and God has it for every one of us. God will fill every one of us. Every vessel shall be filled, but it must be my concern. Lord, what will thou have me to do? And God will give you a job. And there will be forthcoming some real life. A life-giving ministry. And everyone will have a different kind of a ministry. It's our brother Blumenscheid, he took up the German choir, and since that time we have singing in every Sunday morning service. It's wonderful. What is your job? What are you doing? Did you make New York dirty today? <laughs> well, clean up then. 